time, let me take this opportunity uh, to welcome online uh, Professor uh, Bruce Karen Cross. Um, Prof is an emeritus professor at the Department of Geology of uh, Johannesburg. Uh, Prof Bruce uh, is well known, is a well known author and has published 11 books and over 100 articles on South African minerals and gemstones. Uh, he is an accomplished photographer and has won local and international awards for his photos. Uh, Prof is uh, regularly invited to present public lectures on South African minerals and gemstones. So this particular talk, Prof, um, I have to say it's, very, it's one that is very close to my heart because of you speaking about stuff that I like and in fact <laughs> something that I want to get my hands on. So without any waste of time, um, if you have any questions during the talk, please make sure to leave them on the Q&A so that we can get Prof to answer them for, uh, for all of us later on. And uh, from myself, I will check you guys on the other side of the call. Prof, over to you. Thanks, John. Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, also, please allow me just to also say a, a word of thanks to Room to Grow and to Sandby and to Stroke Nature also for inviting me to present this talk today. Um, so it's a pleasure to be doing so. Um, before I start, I would like to just thank the two main institutions or agencies that have supported my research over the years, and that is the National Research Foundation and Samira, which is the National um, Center of Excellence, um, which in fact is the main uh, seat or office is on our campus at uh, the University of Johannesburg. So without their support, um, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. So the Vidvardestrain gold field, history, geology, gold and minerals. Now I've got history and geology in brackets because um, any one of those four titles could encompass a number of talks and a number of publications. So I'm going to try to give a very broad overview in the time available, uh, three quarters of an hour to an hour perhaps, um, of some of the history discovery, the geology. And um, in that picture there that you see on my title slide, it's basically some quartz over some gold in carbon. And I'm going to show you that slide again a little bit further into my presentation. So why the minerals of the Vidwarasan Goldfield? My main interest um, in general is geoheritage and the minerals of localities in our region, in Southern Africa. Um, and if one looks at our region, there are world famous localities for minerals that one can see in local museums, local collections and international museums overseas. And that includes areas in the Otavia mountain land like the Sumeb mine, and also Bach Alkis, which is world famous. The Irongo Mountains in Namibia that have produced the best aquamarines from our region. The southern part, Roshpina and the Scorpion Mines, which are also quite well known uh, for their specimens. Um, northwest part of Zimbabwe, the Muami area, the pegmatites up there have produced world-class topazes, for example. Um, the old Messina mines with their quartz crystals and the blue inclusions that can be seen in many collections. And perhaps in South Africa, the most well-known or famous is the Kalahari manganese field and its minerals. So these are localities that have produced minerals over the years, over the decades, um, that are in many collections. But the Vidvardestrand gold field perhaps is underrepresented um, for various reasons, actually. Um, some of which I will discuss. But one thing that I can say now is that in South Africa, it is illegal for an individual to own unworked gold, unwrought gold or gold specimens. Um, it's against the law. And therefore, that's maybe one of the reasons why virtually no, no one and none of the, the, of the private collectors have any gold specimens yet because it's actually not permitted. So all of the photos I'll be showing you a bit later on are actually from institutional or museum collections. So let's look at the Witt skull field then. So the history, the geology, the gold, and the minerals. Well, the history itself has filled many books um, as to how, who discovered the gold here in the Witt where we are in the Johannesburg area. 
Um, the geology, he has a picture of one of the well-known conglomerates. Um, how did they form? When did they form? Uh, what has happened to them in the last 3 billion years? Then the question about the gold. It's the biggest deposit of gold in the world by far, and it's produced over 55,000 tons of gold since its discovery. Why? Where did the gold come from? And then the minerals. He has just some quartz crystals, um, which, as I say, are not really that well known, but the Vivarisan Goldfield has produced some very interesting and quite famous um, of these particular specimens. So let's have a look. Well, here's Johannesburg. I'm not sure if there's anyone tuned in from overseas, but this is an aerial view which is looking towards the west. Um, he has the University of Johannesburg where I work. And yeah, off in the distance in the haze, you can see some of the old gold mine dumps. This was a slide taken about two years ago. So this is where we are now. But how did this come about? Well, the history and the discovery um, of the Vidwadisand Goldfield is intriguing. And it's featured a lot in our past. It's been featured on a number of commemorative stamps, these postage stamps. Um, there are a lot of old postcards like this one down here showing the old Long Lachte mine um, that, that are available often through collectors and through dealers. Here's another picture of the conglomerate. Here's a share certificate for the Free State Selected Gold Reefs Limited Gold Mine. And actually, it's a share certificate that belonged to my mother, Janet Dukat McGregor Johnson. That was uh, her maiden name. Um, and I still actually have that in my collection. And he has an old prospecting cl claim or a license as well. So all of this is to do with the history. I think most people who know geology and who know the Witz Goldfield, Vidwadisan Goldfield, know that the discovery site of the main reef is on the farm Lang Lachte. So this is a Google image. This is Johannesburg downtown. So here's a scale. So we're looking at a satellite image here of about 40 kilometers from the west to the east. Long Lachte is the site where in February 1886, um, George Walker and George Harrison, so called, stumbled over the outcrop of the conglomerate that contained the gold and that then caused the boom to occur here ever since. And along this line, sort of from east to west, you can see these beige semi-rectangular forms. And those are all of the dumps, the gold mine dumps, that are located more or less along the strike of the main reef. This conglomerate that, they've, that they actually found here outcropping strikes or outcrops here east to west. And that's why, by no coincidence, is where a lot of these mines are located. Um, and if I just overlay a map, an old map on top of this, it's more or less the same line. I'll just alternate between the two slides. So there is Lang Lachter. So that's the old mine there. And here are some of the mines that are quite well known. Crown Mines, Rand Leases, Durban Deep, South Rodeport, going down here off the picture to the West Rand. And to the east is the City Deep, the Simon and Jack, and the Van Dijk Mine down here. So those are some of the mines that one can see here. Um, but did, were they the first to really know about gold in this part of South Africa? That's the question. And it's a question that's been asked by many. And it's been argued about. These are just six books that deal with the history and the discovery of the Vidwaras and gold fields. Um, one year, which is published by John Handley, this for the centennial that was published by Antrobus. And these two, this by Ethel and James Gray, and the one year by Gray himself, Payable Gold. And this small of a narrative history by Eric Rosenthal, Gold, 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 the Janusburg Gold Rush. Um, and this rather obscure publication here, yeah, The Discovery of Gold and the Vidwadisland, this was published in the early 1940s based on the findings of a committee in the 1940s, so 50 years after the discovery, there was still argument and debate going on about who found it and when did they find it and where did they find the gold? And they published this. The general consensus is yes, that Walker and Harrison are the two who should be credited. But let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. 
we need to step back a bit in time in the 1800s and just remember that in Johannesburg, and this is an old map with the old terminology, Transvaal, the Cape Province, and the Free State. Prior to uh, the discovery here, and obviously these are towns in the present day, but there was gold mining and gold discoveries occurring in South Africa, up in what was the Transvaal Republic, the Easterland gold mine, the first gold mine, uh, there was gold being mined, and here in Pilgrim's Rest and Barberton, and down in the Cape Province at Neisner and Prince Albert. But this was all pre-1886. But once word, and maybe it should be emphasized that these miners and these prospectors were traversing the country at the time. So they were traveling up north and they were actually going over, walking over what would become the Vidvardistan goldfield and going north to where these gold rushes were occurring. And a lot of these people were experienced diggers or miners who had come from the California gold rush, from the Australian gold rushes. So, so they were not all by any means greenhorns or in fact novices. But once word started to spread that there was something going on here in what is the current Johannesburg area, they started to migrate to this region. And when did that happen? When did that, that actually start? So let's just zoom in and look a little bit closer here. So here's a map which is uh, drawn by the by the late Fulun, um, uh, one of the Fulun brothers, by Morris Fulun, but based on a map by Despretorius. So there's Pretoria in the north. Here's Johannesburg down here in the south. This is what's called the Johannesburg Granite Dome. And some of these colors here are showing the geology. So this beige color and the yellow are the Vidvardisrand rocks. Uh, the blue are younger overlying rocks of dolomite and uh, this brownish color of some shale. And again, he has a scale of 20 kilometers. So here is down in the south, it says 1886, the South Rand Slope. But in 1853, 33 years before, one Peter Jacob Marais pan gold in the Yuxke and the Crocodile Rivers, well before the gold was discovered. Now, he was panning gold in the river, so that wasn't the gold hosted in the rock. Now, Marais also wasn't some fly-by-night. He actually was an interesting individual. He was born in Cape Town, and when he was 21, he went by ship to California to join the gold rush in California to go and seek his fortune there. But after mixed success, he left, and then he went across the globe to Australia, where gold had been discovered in Victoria, Worked there for some time and then apparently got homesick and wanted to return to South Africa and came back here. And then, um, and this is all pre 1850, obviously. Um, and then in about 1852, I uh, heard about the copper mining in the O'Keefe area and he went up there and he worked some of the copper for a while until he decided to try his fortune coming up to look for gold that was being heard about, uh, but not necessarily the VIT. So he panned here in 1853. So he was the first, perhaps, perhaps the first in 1853 to discover gold, albeit in the rivers. Um, then in 1884, um, Fred Struben, and he also had a brother, the Struben brothers are well known in the history of the gold fields and also in the diamond mines of Kimberley from whence they came, found gold for the first time in the conglomerate, actually the prime ore, in other words. Okay, and then two years later was when Harrison and uh, George Walker found the outcrop here in 1886. So what's interesting about um, Marais is that if we look at a map of Johannesburg, if I, if I just go back here, so he was panning gold up here. So now if we go to the present day, here's a street map of Johannesburg in the River Club area, north of Santon. Here's a picture of the Bramfontein stream or sprayed where gold was panned. And it was decided um, to commemorate this discovery of Marais by naming this road here in River Club. It's called Panner's Lane, after him actually panning the gold. And here's a view of that street or road going in. And here on this wall is a little plaque. And if we just look at that, it's a heritage plaque where uh, Santon Heritage actually have commemorated his discovery here, where it says um, in 1853, he panned gold. So this, in 1975, they named the street Penners Lane um, to actually commemorate him. 
However, it turns out, Eric Rosenthal in his book, the one I showed you earlier, accounts a year earlier, one John Henry Davis, who also was a gold panner, explorer, a digger, and a miner, actually found gold a year earlier on the farm Pardekral, which is here on the west strand at Krugersdorf, so quite close, just to the west. And in fact, it was David Draper, a well-known geologist and well-known amongst the geological community here, who actually knew Davis. And he related in his memoirs how Davis found gold on this farm and he then reported it to the current president of the Transvaal in Porchester, who was perturbed because they were worried if gold was discovered in their, in their, in, in their little um, their colony, yeah, it would create a problem with um, all, all sorts of economic problems for them. So they actually paid Davis an amount of money for his gold and they ordered him to leave the country and he actually had to go back to the Cape Colony. So that is a year before Marie actually panned gold. And, and if, if you look, there's a link here to the Heritage Portal. Uh, James Ball has an article where um, he describes in, um, in more recent times, um, they tried to go back into pan gold there in uh, the Bramfontein Sprite, and I think, and without much success, but that's just an interesting aside after the Panners Lane story. So, yeah, I think is an appropriate quote. The problem for every writer, historian, is not only to identify the man who first proved its true source, that means the true source of the gold, where was it coming from? Yes, it was in the river, it was the banquet formation, but to determine what caused him to suspect this might be so. Never before has this conglomerate proved auriferous. This is pre to 1853. Yet somebody somewhere and at some time carried out that fateful experiment. That's a quote out of his book. And this rather, um, I don't know, perhaps a Stalinistic statue is of George Harrison um, holding up the conglomerate in front of himself, having discovered the outcrop. And this is um, the statue that's here on the eastern side of Johannesburg um, that commemorates that discovery that he made at Blang Laughter. But we need to go back to look at the Steuben brothers, Fred and Harry Steuben, who were very active to the west of the Long Laughter discovery site. Um, they, they, uh, were they the discoverers actually before Harrison? And actually, if you Google George Harrison, uh, just for fun, you obviously hit um, an obvious person from the Beatles. But interestingly enough, down here in the bottom left, you'll see there's a picture of the statue. So he features in amongst the pop music of the 1960s and the 70s, just as an aside. But here is a very important map. And it's a map that was drawn by Fred Steuben and that John Handley, in his book um, I referred to earlier, as reprinted in the end papers of his book. And it's a map that Steuben drew up of his activities out on the West Rand here. And he sent this to um, his wife, but it's, it's a peculiar map. So notice it's upside down. North is to the bottom here, south is to the top, east is left and west is to the right. So strictly speaking, we should invert this. But on the map, Steuben has noted various things. There's obviously roads, road to Pretoria, to the north, road to Sterkfontein, and he's got the little brown dots here, showings of gold, and there's quite a lot of them, color, 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 all over the, on these farms, gold. And then he's named also a number of the reefs or the conglomerates, and there's one in particular that you can just see at the red arrow, and that says the Morella Reef. Now, John Handley, in his book, is adamant that Steuben should be the one who is given the credit for discovering the in situ gold in the conglomerate and not Walker and Harrison a year later, because this Morella reef, according to Handley, is the same as the main reef that you can follow a long strike to the east to where it outcrops at Long Laughter. So these debates can go on and they have been going on for over a century. But here is that famous site taken in 1986 during the centenary of the discovery of the Vrits. So here are three geologists and they are looking at the outcrop and you can see the rocks are dipping steeply to the right. Okay. And they are looking at this weathered conglomerate here, which if we just look up close, that's called the main reef. And just above that is the, what's called the main reef leader. So that's the main reef here. And here on the side is an old adit 
where they were following the reef and mining down along strike. And that's why in that Google Earth image, you can see all of the mine dumps going along, actually paralleling this, um, this outcrop. And it's a national heritage site in South Africa. And in my opinion, if one looks at geoheritage, it should be sacrosanct. It should be the national heritage site for this country because the economy of South Africa uh, came out of the gold mines, notwithstanding all of the later environmental and perhaps socio-economic issues and challenges, but it should really be holy grail amongst heritage sites. So let's have a look and see what has been going on at Long Lachta, which is a proclaimed site in the last, say, 20 years. So I've got a series of five images here of Google Earth over time. So this is a one taken in 2000. So here, that is the little outcrop, that little dot, that's where the outcrop of Long Lachta is. This is Main Reef Road, which has been renamed in South Africa, but still showing Main Reef, and that's the correct name. It's running along the Main Reef. So there is Long Lachta, and there is a visitor center that was built there, a very nice one. It's got a roof cover. There's an old stamp mill that was built there, saved from the Robertson Deep Mine. That one could go, you drive along, you park, and you could walk in here and have a look. So that's in 2000. This is 2009, nine years later. So there, I'm going to keep my cursor on the site. So that's 2009, that's 2000. Okay. So here is a massive area of uh, cars and buses. And we're seeing, yeah, this has become a dumping site. So these actually, this is actually a dumping site down here where garbage is being dumped. So 2009, 2000, 2009. Two years later, yeah, starting to encroach from uh, the Northeast is an open pit gold mine where a company was obviously mining. Because remember, this is outcropping. So they were mining the gold starting to approach the heritage site. And if you just look to where the visitors, where the visitors, where the center is here, you can see, uh, well, I'll go to the next slide. Um, this is in 2013. Okay, so yeah, you can see the mine has worked right up against the fence of the heritage site and the visitor center is virtually gone. It's been stripped, it's been vandalized, unfortunately. Um, in 2013, and this is in 2021, this is a year ago, where the mine has been rehabilitated, and there is the old Long Lachter, and there is what remains of the visitors' center. And in fact, the story doesn't end there, because in 2016, there was a disaster at this particular site. This is the front page of the Star newspaper, and there's just a bit of a timeline at the top, which isn't easy to read, but from the discovery of gold, um, to the establishment of the park, to where in 2016 it says 30 illegal miners are trapped in the disused shaft. And that's the shaft here at Long Laughter. And in fact, here's a photo taken from News24 website where that's that little edit that I showed you early on, where some of the miners they call Zama Zamas are illegally mining and going down the site of a national heritage site in our country. And actually, the site is closed until further notice. I haven't been back there recently, but as far as I know, it is actually still closed, which is a tragedy. And you can just see in the background, yeah, these four pillars, uh, which are all that remains of the visitor's center. So that's rather not, a, not great news about uh, this area where gold was discovered on the Rand and to which South Africa owes a lot of its economy. But let's move on to something a little bit more interesting and a, and a little bit more quirky on the history. There's a photo of Queen Elizabeth, uh, the Queen Mother, and King George during the royal visit to South Africa in 1947. And there's the Queen Mother with a hard hat on. And they are actually coming out of um, Crown Mines Gold Mine. During their tour of the colony in South Africa, they actually had a trip underground. And there's this clipping I found in a newspaper in the Adelaide Advertiser in Australia under a title called Our Empire Section, where they describe how the king and queen went 8,500 feet down a mine shaft, and where he described you shoot down 4,000 feet into the clanking darkness, and then after surviving that went down another 2,000 feet, and then 
descended further in a skip. And I wonder if um, notwithstanding relationships with colonialism, but whether that would still be an event that would happen today. And in fact, the uh, Royal Archives in um, London have got other photos of this particular visit, but not this one, which I happen to have, and I happen to get through a friend of mine. So that's kind of an interesting thing if one has a look at the history. Before we move on to geology, obviously, since mining has been going on there for over 120 years, there's been post mining problems or challenges. Um, the mine dumps are being reworked in places and their exposure has resulted to air pollution, and to dust. These are Morris Fulhoun photos again. Um, acid mine drainage of the old dumps, the decanting of the water once the mines closed and the ground table started to move to the surface. And then also the social and the labor with the migrant laborers. And if anyone is interested in that, the, I could recommend this book by Charles van Onsen, The Night Trains, in which he described how the mine workers came in by train from adjacent countries and especially in Mozambique. But this is a whole area on its own and I won't really go much further into that. Let's look at the gold mines. Lots of achievements. And as I say, a lot of them have featured on stamps. So yeah, in one year, here was a, was a 30th anniversary for the deepest gold mine in the world, which is the Western Deeps Mine. They've been renamed now. Um, there's a view, and yes, on the first day cover of the stamps, you have just a section through the mine from the surface going down the shaft through all of the levels and a virtual underground town or city with uh, thousands of workers underground. So achievements in the gold mining sector are legendary. If one looks at the world's deepest mines, um, there are six that are in South Africa and six are gold mines. So I've just made a little table here of the gold mine with their names in Poneng, Drifontein, Kusasaletu going down here, where they are. Most are on the West Rand, some are down further west to Clarksdorp, Kupanang. And um, just some of the reserves at the time in June 19 and the geological formation they were mining, the upper Ellsbergs, I'll show you these in a while, the VCR. And then the depth below surface in meters, 4,270, three and a half, almost three and a half kilometers, 3.3. And so you go down the deepest mine in Ponding, that's the Western Deeps, second deepest, third deepest, fourth deepest, and the seventh and the 10th. And this, type of mining underground necessitated unique technology, mining, te uh, mining technology, cooling, for example. I mean, how do you cool a mine four kilometers below the surface of the earth? That was achieved here by engineers and metallurgists in South Africa, major achievements. Okay, the geology. Um, this is a stamp that was um, commissioned in 2016 when it was the International Geology Congress in Cape Town here in South Africa. And it shows actually quite nicely pictorially Johannesburg. Um, it, it shows the geology here, the rocks, and it shows you how they are dipping down uh, towards the south. And these are supposed to be the conglomerates. Uh, there are the dolomites on top. There's the granite underneath. And here's the high rise of Johannesburg. And what I quite like, it's showing a storm, showing rain and yeah, thunder and lightning, showing maybe the weathering of these rocks and how they're breaking down and maybe they are liberating the gold because it was on this weathered outcrop where Harrison and Walker and Steuben found their gold to begin with. And only after they mined through the weather did they get down into the unweathered, unoxidized part of the ore body that created another set of challenges, which was solved by the cyanide process. But I like that stamp, it's pictorial. And I like this because this is a sample, it's about the size of half a brick. And it kind of represents the buildings of Johannesburg, the high rise buildings on top of the gold bearing reefs. This is a polished slab of rock showing the gold in the carbon leader. So that's quite nice. So the geology. The rocks are Archean in age. They're three billion to 2.7 billion years old. The entire succession is a few thousand meters thick or several thousand meters thick. It's not preserved everywhere. And it's predominantly a sedimentary succession with a few minor volcanic lavas and some chemical sediments, some iron formations. And because it's so old and it's been buried and covered by much younger rocks and subjected to earth processes, it's been metamorphosed, heated up, 
and structurally deformed. There's a major structural complexity, um, but the degree of metamorphism is not high grade, it's fairly low grade. And it's this metamorphism and this heating up, if you like, that is part of the story of where did the gold come from. And there's gold in the conglomerates, but there's also uranium. And I'm not going to talk too much about the uranium, but that is also, and it's also an important economic um, a commodity. And as I said, over 55,000 tons of gold has been mined since its discovery, a prodigious amount of gold. And according to estimates, uh, resources and reserves, it still possesses 40%, you know, that changes of all known gold reserves, albeit at great depth. So here's a, um, a, a summary of that geology, several thousand meters thick. Um, the yellow is basically the quartzites, um, the tan colored is shale, and these dots here are supposed to be showing the conglomerates. And then the lava is this green. There's the crown lava, and there's another lava up here. Um, the terminology, the whole succession is called the Vidvarastrand supergroup, and it's divided into two big groups. The lowest part, which starts here and goes down, is called the Westrand group, and that's overlain by what's called the Central Rand group. And the main economic conglomerates or reefs are up here in the Central Rand group. There are some below. Uh, in the West End group, the government reef and the coronation. Um, but the main ones are up here in the top. So essentially a, a sedimentary succession. Where does it occur geographically? Well, this map by McCarthy and others um, was published in a, in a paper they wrote. So here's South Africa and here this is enlarged. So there's Johannesburg, Pretoria. So if we were to strip away the younger rocks that lie on top, this is what we see remaining of the Vivardisrand the sedimentary basin, um, with some outliers around about. This is what we call the Colesburg Basin, the Bethlehem Basin, and out here in the east, the Pongola Supergroup or the Mozan Basin. So the brown here, you can see that's the lowest part. That's that West Rand group on the outside. And here, the Central Rand one, which has got uh, the gold bearing conglomerates. And round about on the edge of the basin, we see the various gold fields from Valcom, Plagstorp, Coltonville, West Rand, going round to Evander and the South Rand. So these actually sit around the perimeter of this ancient, very ancient sedimentary basin. So where did the rocks come from? All observers have come to the same conclusion. It has exceptional character, the conglomerate. And geologically speaking, there's no resemblance to anything hitherto discovered. This is a Hugh Exton's address in the 1896 of the inaugural address of the Geological Society. And as Draper asked, whence could this great succession of beds, conglomerate beds have been derived? And here again, you see a piece of conglomerate. It's primarily composed of pebbles of quartz. This is vein quartz, white vein quartz and gray vein, vein quartz. And in amongst in the matrix is quartz grade sand and pyrite. What you see here is actually pyrite in amongst the matrix, fool's gold. And there are some other clasts as well, or pebbles. We sometimes see shale or banded iron formations, but vein quartz is by far the most common. And this is where it came from. This is, a, again, with permission, Norman and Whitfield uh, from one of the Strait publications. And it shows, going back three billion years in a time machine, how we have a hinterland or a provenance surrounding this depression in the crust of the earth, the basin, the Vidwadestrand basin, with weathering and erosion occurring, rivers transporting sediment and gravel into this basin and depositing it as the conglomerates and the quartzites. And the further out you go into the basin, depositing the clays and the muds, the fine grain material out of suspension. And early on in the succession down below here, for example, in the West Strand group, there are some chemical sediments, the iron formations. So here's the West Strand group here. There's the crown lava. And that's been dated geochronologically. That's how we know how old the rocks are. And here are some of the reefs, main reef, Kimberley Reef, and the Mondial. <clears throat> so th this is the sedimentary succession. And notice here on the side, there's a fault. So there's been structure. Uh, that has disrupted the whole succession after it was deposited. So just to show you an example, yeah, I'll show you a slide underground of one of the Kimberley reefs. This is a Matt Mullins 
slide and it belongs to, it's in the collection of the Geological Society of South Africa. If you go to their website, you'll see a number of these slides there that you can download for free. He has a hammer for scale. There's someone standing here so you can see his boot. And that's part of the Kimberley Reef. So there's the conglomerate lying on top of the quartz sites and overlain by the quartz site. So that's what the gold mines are after. That's that pebble conglomerate containing the gold. Sedimentary origin, it's unquestionably so. And there, there is evidence. Um, he has two polished slabs of some of the quartz sites and the conglomerates. And you can see pyrite on both of these, which is dipping down at an angle here to the right. There's some there and there's some here. And that's been interpreted that at the time of deposition, when this gravel and sandy material was moving along underwater, like of this little block diagram, as these sandbars, it migrates as these bars or dunes, and the sediment moves along and it avalanches down the front of the dune, and so it migrates. And as it moves along in amongst the mixed sand is the pyrite, and that then defines these layers here, which is called cross bedding. So there's some direct evidence of depositional, primary depositional environment of the pyrite. The people who believe that there's more hydrothermal origin to the gold as opposed to sedimentological origin may argue that this is actually pyrite that has percolated along permeability zones and crystallized later. You know, there's always an either or when it, when it comes to the Vidvardis land. But 55,000 tons of gold. From whence did that come, as the question has been asked? Because if you look at all the other gold mines in the world, ever known, I mean, if you were to erode them, you'd be hard pressed to produce all the gold that is sitting in this tiny little repository here in South Africa. A number of origins have been proposed over time, and none are really new, some starting already in the late 1800s. That the gold, as we saw, was is of sedimentary origin. It was eroded from source rocks in the hinterland and washed in as tiny gold particles with the sediment, so-called a placer deposit within the rivers. There's also, and I must acknowledge my friend and colleague here, Professor McCarthy, who is reinvestigating this. Already in the 1950s, there was some proposal that some of these conglomerates may be glacial deposits actually tillites, um, and that was sort of forgotten, but that's being revisited now with some interest, and um, we look forward to perhaps seeing a bit of a development on that front, especially for things like the VCR, the Fentersdorp Contact Reef. Placer. The second big argument is it's hydrothermal. Uh, in other words, we deposited all of that plastic sediment, thousands of meters, buried it, and much later, with hydrothermal hot fluids carrying gold in solution, the gold precipitated out later in the conglomerates, so-called epigenetic, gold and other minerals. Now there's evidence for both of these because we get fine gold particles that crystallize, but we also get tiny nuggets that are washed in. There's also a proposal that used to be volcanic. In other words, that at the time there was volcanic eruptions at the time of deposition, um, syngenetic, in other words, at the same time, epi means later, epigenetic, and that the gold, like the black smokers that we see today on the ocean floors, precipitated the gold out in solution in the conglomerates. Uh, there's the hags, the hydrothermally altered granites, because some of the placer gold uh, is believed to come from greenstone belts, but some maybe comes from granites. And then the general accepted theory amongst most geologists these days, although not all, is what's called the modified placer. In other words, we say, yes, in the beginning, gold was transported in from some source in the hinterland, deposited and preserved. And then later, because of hydrothermal later act activity and metamorphism, some of it gets remobilized and reconcentrated. Um, and then there are some other more obscure or um, obscure ideas or theories. So this is just two cartoons out of Cook and Ruiz's paper, just to show you, here's the he has the placer model where we erode the sediment and there's some gold in veins that's coming in with the plastic sediment and getting deposited at the same time. The hydrothermal model, we don't have this. We deposit all the sediment and much later coming below from the mantle, for example, hydrothermal fluids carrying gold in solution or hydrothermal fluid leaching the gold out 
um, if you go with this model, that's the modified type of theory where we first deposit this and then we remobilize actually some of it. And there's really a plethora of paper of these papers on the deposit. I can only, I'll just put three here. Um, there's one in Nature Geoscience by Heinrich, but Vardestan gold deposits formed by volcanic rain, anoxic, no oxygen, rivers, and Archean life, early life. Um, <clears throat> this paper, um, again, in Nature, gold buried by oxygen. We said it contains an extraordinary amount of gold. Um, and the, the paper by Neil Phillips and Powell, um, the protagonists of more of the metamorphic origin uh, or the hydrothermal origin. So there's data out there within the rocks, within the chemistry, within the minerals that actually supports the modified plaster theory. And although some people see that as a bit of a cop out, that tends to be the general consensus. Um, let's start to look at some of this gold. Some time ago, actually in 1987, um, a publication in America, uh, the Mineralogical Record, had a special issue on gold, on gold specimens, these spectacular gold specimens. And um, interestingly enough, there's a cover of the magazine, and I just copied the index. And if you just look at the index, you see Australia, California, Colorado, North America, museums, England, and then recent discoveries, Venezuela, Arizona, Siberia, nowhere there is South Africa. Yet we've got the biggest gold deposit by far, and it's been going, this is 1987, so it would be 101 years. Why is that? Was it a remiss of the editors or not? It wasn't actually. It's because macro large big specimens like this one here are very, very rare from the Vidwaras land. Most of the, of the Vidvaristrand gold is microscopic and often it's actually tied up in the pyrite. It's only when we get this remobilization that we start to see gold recrystallizing in quartz veins, for examples. So I'd like to show you some examples of Vidvaristrand gold in institutional collections that is not commonly seen by the public. First of all, here's a polished slab of conglomerate. It comes from the Valcom gold field. And, um, there's, there's a quartzite at the base here, and these are some of the quartzite pebbles, and this is the reef above. And you can see some yellowish material throughout here. So this is in light on the specimen. This is the same specimen with reflected light, with the light bouncing off the side, exactly the same. So all the round, shiny objects you see here are pyrite. Those are rounded grains of pyrite, including this. That's actually a pyrite grain there. Remember, this is only 6.7 centimeters. But the yellow you see coming along the basal contact here, that's visible gold, which has been concentrated along the bottom of the reef here, together with some disseminated microscopic gold in the pyrite. So that's quite nice to see. And you only really see it when you can get the reflected light. Gold crystals are extremely rare. Um, and this is a specimen from a, a, an unknown mine in the Vidvaras Rand, but it's this dendritic bit of gold projecting out of the vein quartz. Um, quite a nice, almost about, about seven centimeters in length. This is a 10 centimeter specimen from the Vogelstrace Bult mine. And I might add that most of these gold specimens I'm showing you come from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and perhaps a bit later, pre-World War II, certainly, when gold specimens were donated to museums in South Africa, but very rich gold interspersed within white vein quartz. Here's another example from the Rietfontein mine. Um, in, uh, it's, it's about 12.8 centimeters, and it's, it's gold that's been smeared into this rather sheared quartzitic rich rock. Here's another example, interestingly showing gold, this like a filigree gold in amongst the white quartz uh, with pyrite on top. So it's actually showing both um, pyrite in the vein quartz. And again, obviously this is hydrothermal, this is recrystallized gold. And in fact, some of the wire gold here is retaining this piece of quartz, which would other which would otherwise actually fall off. This is from the Robinson Deep Mine. 
and that's um, yeah, two historical postcards. There's that same particular specimen. So there's a, a view. It says a walling a stope 800 feet below the surface, and it shows you rather the early style of mining in the Witz Goldfield. And here's an old postcard of um, the headgear at the Robinson Deep Mine. And just to show you where it is in perspective, uh, just to remind you again, here's Johannesburg. There's Robinson Deep Gold Mine over there, and there's Long Laughter to the south. So we're talking about this mine here, just to the southwest of um, downtown Johannesburg. Another gold from west, the West Driefontein mine. Um, again, uh, sort of flattened seaweed type gold. Here's one in my hand to show you the scale, to show you the size of the piece, 15 centimeters unspecified mine in the museum collection. Another one. This is quite large. It weighs 1.14 kilograms, and it's it's got vein quartz in it, um, but still, there's a lot of gold in there. It's an estimated close to $50,000 in bullion value today. Um, two more specimens, historical. This is from the late 1900s from the East Rand Goldfield. And this one from 1895 from the Rose Deep Mine in Germiston. So that's a very old historical, and it's well labeled, 900 foot down. 15 centimeters across. And this iconic and perhaps one of the most famous gold specimens from the Bidvada Strand, um, it featured on the cover of John McIver's 1960s book, Gems, Minerals and Rocks of Southern Africa. It's skeletal, it's an octahedron, but it's actually skeletal. It's not completely solid gold. You see the vein quartz in between and delineates the edge of the octahedron on the top and the bottom. And that's actually on the cover. The actual entire specimen is interesting because one often sees that, but that's the entire piece. It's about, um, I think it's about 25 centimeters or so across, and there the crystals are sitting on the top. And for a long time, it was thought that these were the only crystals of this type ever to be found or preserved, let's say, from the bits. But subsequently, I've seen this as well, and it's also skeletal octahedral crystals. You can see here in the vein quartz, there's some more up there. And here's another example, a small 1.6 centimeters of solid octahedrons. Now, crystalline gold, crystals, octahedron or cubes is rare at the best of times. From the Vidvada strand, it's ultra rare. So these are really, really geo heritage items extraordinaire. A couple more vein quartz in gold. Here's another one from the East Strand gold mine. Um, he has a or rather spectacular piece, butter yellow gold. Really, that's the true color. 16 and a half centimeters. Um, two more from East Rand Gold Mine. Um, and here's another large one, 44 ounces, including the rock, okay, but from the Nigel Reef out on the East Rand. Um, and this uh, solid gold key made from Bidvada Strand Gold presented, there's an inscription on the top of the key here, presented to H. Eckstein acting chairman of the Morda B gold mines by the employees on the occasion of the opening of the recreational in January the 6th, 1914. And that's in the museum collection, a solid gold key. It's quite interesting. This is an interesting specimen as well because it's actually gold, but it's smeared on a talc schist. So it's not in vein quartz and it's not sitting in a conglomerate. It's actually in one of the metamorphosed and structurally sheared, slick and sided talc schist, again from the Valcom Goldfield. Uh, that's rather an unusual association. Then before we leave gold, we cannot do so without talking about the carbon leader. This little vein of carbon or pyrobitumen, kerogen carbon, that is impregnated with gold. Um, and you can just see in this particular specimen, you can see the visible gold in it. He has two more examples. Yes, he, uh, he has a carbon leader on edge, actually, actually vertically and quite thick, showing the, the carbon pyrobitumen fibers that were believed to be early um, forms of algae trapping the gold, acting like a corduroy table. And this is the top surface of a carbon leader, where not only is gold between the vertical columns or fibers, but it can also be smeared along the upper surface of the carbon leader. And a lot of work has been done on 
these hydrocarbons and how did they come about? Never mind the gold, never mind the rocks. You know, is it biogenic, biological, archean life on Earth? Is it inorganic carbon uh, coming up from the mantle? Um, and here's a paper, just it's in the it's a Joel Sock of America special publication by Jill Drennan and by Laurie Robb. <clears throat> um, and I just took a few lines out of it: circulation of these hydrocarbon-rich fluids and precipitation of the bitumen uh, and mineralization uh, it, is, is how they interpret um, this particular hydrothermal component of the mineralization. It's actually uh, an interesting phenomenon in the Vidvardistrand. Here's just another example of a spectacular carbon leader. This is a 13th centimeter long piece, and you can see the gold on edge in cross section and smeared all along the top. That's all gold actually stretching out along the upper surface. And that's quite thick. That's about a three, three centimeter thick carbon leader. Then this bizarre pyrobitumen or carbon, these globules of carbon, which are undoubtedly of secondary origin because they're completely encased in this cubic well-formed pyrite. So this is hydrothermal, much later formed kerogen that's been remobilized as these globules within the pyrite. And here's another example, beautiful cubic pyrite with the kerogen. So that's the gold. I'll quickly go through some of the interesting, some of the minerals. Um, people always ask, why, why do you talk about the minerals and the Vidvada strand? Well, you know, if you go to museums, often they're the things that people want to see. Where's the gold? Where's the diamonds? You know, Minerals are non-renewable. They're not things, once a mine is gone or a quarry is gone, you cannot form them again. Um, they can be collected by private individuals. There's undoubtedly scientific value. And some of the minerals in the vits are used to argue hydrothermal origin, plaza origin, for example. Um, the evolution of ore deposits, if we can preserve these minerals, or be they aesthetic or not, we can learn something about how they form in the sequence. Um, and then collecting minerals for some people is an investment. Um, but like any investments, there are, there are some risks involved. So there are 140 minerals or so documented in the Vidvardistrand. And for the article I wrote for Rocks and Minerals in 2021, I tried as far as I could to go through all of the literature, and I'm not going to discuss these today, so don't worry. But in A to Z of the minerals, you can see there's a, there are oxides, there are silicates, there are sulfides, there are hydroxides, um, there, there, are, there are platinoids, etc. And a lot have been published and a lot are microscopic. So there's the beginning of an A to Z. It continues. There are two type specimens in the Vervada strand, isofera platinum, and uh, published by Cabri and Feather, and Moderite, uh, which is published by Cooper in 1923, and then uh, the, the end of the A to Z. So 140 specimens. Um, I'll just show you some of these, which are, let's say, more aesthetic, and some of which are kind of interesting for the vits. So we'll do it alphabetically from bearite ending with the sphalerite. And all of these are secondary hydrothermal. So here's a tabular bearite crystal from uh, the old Val Reefs mine now called the Kopanang. It's a bearite and it's totally enclosed by pyrite. There's a tiny grains of pyrite that were trapped inside this bearite as it actually crystallized from the Clarksdorp goldfield. But this is a bearite of note. And there's a couple of things in this slide. This is the old Elans Rand gold mine. Well, old, it's called the Kusasaletu now. And in 1997, the mine geologist Brenda Rademeyer was working underground at more than two and a half thousand meters below surface. And, and in the foot wall of the mining, the VCR, saw a vug or a cavity and noticed there were some little quartz crystals and things were poking their nose out. And she took this picture and there's a key for scale. So there's some quartz and there's some galena and some pyrotite, the iron sulfide. But on closer examination, the pocket widened out and they discovered two bearite crystals, of which that is one here. Okay, and there's my hand for scale. This is a bearite crystal that weighs 64 kilograms, and it's perfectly formed. It's euhedral. You can see the terminations on it here. It's got a galena crystal embedded in it. And there's even a bigger one, which broke into three when they tried to retrieve it. And here's another bearite of 28 centimeters. 
And to our knowledge, this is the largest bayrite, euhedral bayrite crystal ever found in the world anywhere. So that's rather interesting. The largest bayrite crystal comes from a Vidvardhisrand gold mine. The story of how they removed it from the mine is interesting, and that's in another publication, having to carry it out from underground two and a half thousand odd meters below surface. So massive bayrite. Calcite is fairly common in some of the vugs, um, but most of these minerals are quite rare because of the mining technique that's used and also um, the preservation potential of minerals is quite rare. So museums are the places to see them. So this is grayish colored calcite with some quartz from the Free State Gedult mine. This is a large calcite, it's 24 by 16 centimeters and you can see the rhombohedras here, but this sort of gray sheen um, is, is a coating of, of clinochlor. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a clay mineral. And it comes from the President Bran number two shaft, a 6,800 level um, from a vug that was collected there by the mine manager in the 1960s. Um, this is some calcite crystals on two doubly terminated quartz, again, coated with some of this little clinochlor. It's like tiny little shiny crystals of mica. That's almost how it occurs from the present brand mine. This is clinochlor included in the quartz crystal, again from the present brand mine, 4.2 centimeters, quite attractive. And there's some larger clinochlors that look like muscovite down below here, but it's actually not. We've XID'd and we've ID'd these. And you have some more calcite from uh, Val reefs with some quartz crystals. These are the calcite crystals here. Um, a twinned calcite, so-called fishtail for obvious reasons, and it's impregnated with pyrite, um, associated in the background with some quartz. This is from uh, the Biffelsfontein gold mine, and that's about four centimeters across. Chalco pyrite, there are secondary sulfides within some of these associations, and these are quite nice large crystals, again, associated with quartz. So copper sulfides, copper iron sulfides. And this strange, it's, 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 it's not a great photo, but it's only, that's 1.8 centimeters. And that's actually a crystal of cubanite, which is a copper iron sulfide. And it's associated here with pyrotite, which is another one of the sulfides. And yes, cubanite occurs elsewhere in the world, um, but it's very rare in Southern Africa. And again, as far as we can establish this 1.8 centimeter crystal is the largest cubanite known from any deposit in Southern Africa. So there's the second largest known. And then the diamonds, again, a topic on their own. Um, in the 1800s, from the sluice boxes on the gold mines down in the Clarksdorf gold fields, were retrieved these green diamonds. Um, now, remember, we're talking about diamonds in the matrix of the conglomerate. So in other words, these had to have been in existence in the origin of uh, the source area where the rocks are being eroded and transported in with the gravel. So they were not hydrothermal. So in other words, these diamonds are older than 3 billion years, years old in the Vits. And some were saved and some are preserved in some of the museum collections. And in this um, 1897 publication by Denny, he describes in quite a bit of detail how some of these were found and how they were preserved. And some later work on them uh, by amongst others, Raal in the American Mineralogist in 1969, did some work on these as to why they are green. If you examine them, the green coloration is like a skin, like an orange skin on the outside. And the inside of the diamonds is actually colorless. So it's a rind. And that has been believed to be caused by radiation of the uranium that is also within the conglomerate. That it's irradiated these diamonds, forming this green color, but it didn't penetrate all the way into the center. And then some work done um, by Katie Smart and others in 2016 on some of these diamonds. They used them to argue the existence of early plate tectonics. Uh, by analyzing the chemistry and trace element and isotopic composition of these diamonds. So they are very, very interesting. Ancient, ancient diamonds coming up with the conglomerates. Back to the more mundane. This is a little dolomite specimen from the Kloof gold mine. There's some secondary pink dolomite. Uh, there's also epidote, which attests to the alteration. Obviously, epidote is often associated with um, epidotization um, 
It's a calcium iron silicate from the free state Gedult mine again. Um, and then another secondary mineral um, in general used to be called apophyllite. It's now fluor apophyllite. It's an alkali, alkali silicate. This is a little doubly terminated crystal uh, with quartz. So more apophyllite, a fluor apophyllite K, yeah, with some clinochlor in it. Um, and then the sulfides. Um, which maybe should be open for some research as well. Um, this is a sphalerite zinc sulfide um, that was overgrown by a euhedral galena crystal, again from the Free State Gedult mine down in Velkom. Some more galena with some quartz, well-formed galena crystals. You know, you expect galena in a, in a lead zinc mine, you know, the Penning mine, for example, um, or an MVT deposit. These are secondary galena crystals in the Witz gold mine. Galena and sphalerite. Uh, the small amber-colored sphalerites with the galena. Secondary natrolite occurring in vugs and cavities, some of these little flat needles, that's about seven centimeters, 10 centimeters. Then the so-called buckshot pyrite, I showed you some of this early on. This is how some of the pyrite occurs in these rounded buckshot pyrites. And again, a lot of research and PhDs have been done on these are they detrital? Are they secondary? Are they altered from pyzoliths, et cetera, et cetera? The debate goes on. Pyrite coating calcite uh, from the Free State Gold Fields, very aesthetic, looks like gold, but feels gold. That definitely looks like gold, but that's actually a fantastic pyrite from the Valcom Gold Field. Uh, galena embedded again in pyrite. We had earlier sphalerite, sphalerite in galena. So one starts looking at these pathogenesis, you know, when are the sulfides forming and why? Then pyrotite, the iron the sulfide. And again, these are platy crystals, six centimeters, four and a half. The largest pyrotites from Southern Africa, from a Witz gold mine, the third biggest there is. And used by Johan de Villiers, and Lyles to define the crystal structure of so-called pyrotype 6C, one of the uh, crystallographic forms. They used the pyrotype from Mponeng mine samples to actually define the crystallography of the pyrotype. And this was published in American, uh, the, the uh, journal, the mineralogist, the American mineralogist. And then, Finally, as we're getting on, this is quartz. There's a lot of quartz around in the quartz sites and the pebbles, and some of that obviously is recrystallized as very aesthetic specimens. These are from Irland's Rand gold mine, just showing you some, some about the size of my fist, some quite a lot larger, some with pyrotite. Uh, here's one from Val Reefs. These are quite spectacular that were collected by a miner once in 1992. And here's one which is quite interesting because it's got quartz crystals and it's kind of a bit of an assemblage of everything. It's on the conglomerate, on the foot wall. There's some pyrite in here. There's pyrotite. There's some galena. There's some sphalerite all in one from Mponeng gold mine. Sphalerite with barite from Randfontein Estates and sphalerite with gold and quartz. And here, a twin sphalerite, 3.2 centimeters. And this large 7.6 centimeter sphalerite crystal again from the Free State, but collected in the 1960s. So an old historic specimen. So to summarize, just before we close, highlights. The largest barite crystal in the world comes from the Witwatersrand saint gold mines. The largest sphalerites in Southern Africa to date from the Wits. Largest cubonite. And they are world-class gold specimens, albeit rare, also from there, and three billion year old alluvial diamonds in the conglomerates. That's quite a story for these gold deposits. So what about the future, just to end off? Is it good news or bad news? Depends what you want to talk about. If we look at some graphs of gold production, going back to the 1960s for China, Australia, America, and South Africa, here's our graph, South Africa, and it's not on a great trend. In 1970, the country mined 1,000 tons of gold. In 2020, 100 tons, 10 times less. That's a downward jet. While other countries, if we look up until 1980, more or less flat, the USA went down a bit. Uh, China, you see, was actually climbing, climbing, and Russia and Australia. So 
on a graphical format, this doesn't look very promising. Uh, and if you just look at some of the major producers in 2021, um, China, Australia, Russia, United States, Canada, Ghana, uh, oh, sorry, I just covered that up. South Africa, here we are at number 10. There's the 100 tons. So the industry appears to be on a downward trend, but is that necessarily so? Well, here's my last slide, a view of downtown Johannesburg, taken from an office window at the university and during a major storm at sunset, and it's the city of gold, literally. Is our future on of the city uh, gone? Well, Tucker Fulun and Fulun in the 2016 IGC publication, <clears throat> 2016 to date, more than 52,000 tons of gold has been extracted from the deposit and an estimated 30,000 tons remaining as an inferred resource. That means possibly we can still mine for a long time, depending on all sorts of economic, social, and technological challenges that we may have. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, I hope you enjoyed the talk and I went over an hour, but a big topic. Thanks very much. Sure, well done, Prof. Um, <laughs> I think you've got everybody just uh, just excited. You know, I think we've got so many questions online um, and, and, and all of them requiring your, your expertise. So, Prof, let me just uh, once again just take this opportunity to thank you for this wonderful talk and um, really, really appreciate it. And um, I'm just going to jump straight into it. I'm going to sure. start with Jenny's question um, and, and just, uh, you know, an overarching question about, um, about what's so special about the Vets Vatos Rand that, that has so much gold. What is it about this place um, versus any other, other place in South Africa or, or perhaps elsewhere? That is the question that's been asked for, what, what is it now, 136 years, Jenny. And it's a, it's a question that I, don't, I personally don't think is answerable in a 100% way. There are other types of conglomerates around to the Vidvadistan. You know, there are conglomerates, for example, in Canada, um, which may be not quite as old, but they are there. But yet they don't have this goal. Um, why is there so much gold and where did it come from that that is the billion billion dollar question uh, and 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 i don't have the answer it's it's truly for once we can use the word without any uh shadow of doubt the vidvadistan goldfield is unique it is really unique and obviously if one could find if it's somewhere out there lying under the cover of younger rocks the source if there's still more gold that can be that could have been eroded in um well that would be the Eldorado. but the other thing to remember perhaps is remember we're looking at south africa as it looks today with our coastline and our continent our subcontinent but remember we're talking about three billion years ago when the land masses the ancient continents were totally totally different to what we see today I mean, the, the tip of Africa, we were sitting on a continent that was called the Carpval Craton, which was an ancient continent that didn't look anything like Africa. And we were joined at the time to some other ancient continents, something equivalent of Australia, maybe, was joined at the side. Since then, we've broken up with plate tectonics, reformed, rejoined, broken up. So maybe the sources for some of this gold wasn't even sitting on our hinterland in South Africa. It was some ancient continent that's long gone. You know, these debates can go on forever. It's a good question. Sure. And, um, and just picking that on um, into Charles's question, saying, um, why does it seem like there's no gold between Clackstop and Falcom? Um, what's the phenom phenomenon about that? Um, look, there are things there are gaps between the gold fields i suppose but you know i guess one should also remember that those little that those points on the map are um are like isolated and uh, they i must be careful with my answer because i'm not a i'm not a gold fields geologist i mean as i say my main interest is in um, the in the heritage and in the minerals but but there are structural reasons sometimes where things have been faulted out um, and there hasn't been preservation um, of the conglomerates. I haven't actually spoken in great depth about the structure. There are major unconformities. In other words, areas where parts of the succession have been removed 
due to maybe you know uplift and erosion. And also, I didn't mention at all, look, time is a problem, but the Freer de Fort impact structure, that huge meteorite that hit South Africa and that upturned and overfolded the rocks of the, of the Witwatersrand that were, that were already there, those were upturned and they were actually preserved, you know, from erosion because they helped to bury um, the existing rocks. So there's geological complexity um, to answer that particular question. Sure. Prof, let me just um, take you into quick heritage. Um, you mentioned um, uh, on the presentation about um, the mining, the different type of mining techniques that perhaps maybe have an impact on, on the pre preservations of minerals and, and, and other deposits. Um, could you just expand a little bit um, on that in terms of the dangers of our mining technique and the type of impact it has on, on, on the landscape as we understand it? Well, you know, if, I, if, if one's talking about um, the underground mines, um, uh, the impact on the landscape is almost nil because they're so deep. I mean, obviously, the dumps on surface is another story. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the open pit mines, obviously, from an environmental standpoint, um, mines are obliged by law to rehabilitate after they've mined. So during the mining operation, there's an impact. Um, but the, you know, the mining, and, but maybe it's true for any mine, you know, to mine, you've got to blast with explosives and um, by blasting, if you have any of these hollows or cavities or surfaces on faults where you can get the growth of these nice aesthetic crystals to form, you know, any blasts are going to shatter those. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning, you're going to be destroying these just because of the way you have to blast the rock. But <clears throat> the other thing about the Vidvada strand is the nature of the rock types. As I said, they're mainly quartzites and conglomerates. And those rocks, unlike limestones and dolomites, they tend to dissolve in, you know, over millennia and make nice caves and cavities where you can grow these minerals. These kind of silicic rocks don't necessarily do that easily. So I, I believe there's a very small amount of space that was formed by these later events that allowed these minerals to be preserved, actually, in the first place. Sure. Definitely very interesting. Now, let me just take an outlier question. <laughs> and, and I suppose uh, a lot of people want to understand this. Um, and this uh, it's, it's, you know, a build up from Renee's question, who says, um, if, if gold in the vet's vital strength is, is microscopic, how are the Zamazamas actually finding it? <laughs> and how are they, are they doing? What are they doing? What's their secret? <laughs> um, look, I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I must, I must say, um, I, d I don't know their secret, but obviously, if they are organized, which they appear to be, and they have a whole line of production, um, if, if they are going underground and they are digging out the unweathered conglomerate with the pyrite in and they're taking it to surface and they are then processing the ore on a micro scale as opposed to a great big mining plant, if they're processing it with you know, roasting the ore or, you know, through the cyanide process, God forbid, um, you know, environmentally, they obviously must have ways of doing it um, to actually process the ore because they, they are, um, look, they, there's actually two things. If they, if they are scratching around on the surface in the weathered rock, where the rock has broken down and the gold has been, and, and the ore has been oxidized, it has liberated the gold and there's free gold in the actual surface material Th that they can actually um, mine and they can then wash and they can just extract the albeit tiny gold particles i mean you can wash tiny gold as you as you do in a river you pan and you can get a lot of gold that way but if they are down in the mines deep down in the gold mines as they appear to be in some places they're mining the unoxidized ore and they must be very well organized to process that to liberate the gold and then to obviously sell it on the black market i don't know look i i i i can only think of you know are, are, are they taking that are they mining the volumes of ore that they can take it illegally to a gold smelting plant that everyone is in i can only it's all conjecture i i don't know um but it is a worry and i mean it's a worry not just in the vits it's occurring in the barberton gold mines for example they are everywhere and they are major major Never mind environmental problems, but 
the social problems with with what's going on. Mm. And uh, and Prof, perhaps maybe you could um, just uh, guide us. Is this a South African phenomenon or is this a global challenge where you find these illegal miners just uh, going into old um, mines and just going in and doing their own thing? No, I don't think it's unique to South Africa. I mean, there are there is what's called artisanal miners, you know, where you know, it could be emeralds in Colombia, for example. You know, if someone has a strike of emeralds, you know, somewhere in the mountains, then there's a rush and everyone goes there. Because, you know, let's be honest, a lot of, um, uh, not everyone by any means, a lot of it is greed. But I think a lot of the informal mining, zama zamas, artisanal miners, is economically driven. They're people who are desperate to try and scratch a living out of something. And it often ends up as illegal operations. Um, some are obviously highly organized, like some of the Zama Zamas, but some are, you know, people just who are walking around and, you know, they claim jumpers everywhere. Talk about claim jumpers, whether it's here or in North America or Australia. It's, it's not a, it's, I don't think it's a unique phenomenon to us at all. Mm. Um, I'm not uh, asking these questions in any particular order. So, um, so uh, everybody that's still on the call and there's still a lot of us on the call um uh, just be um you know just bear with us um prof let me just um maybe as i'm taking the you know questions randomly uh, let me take cecilia's question um and and this is uh, particularly perhaps maybe interesting also to all of us um is the new gold still being formed in this area you know in the areas where there's been traditionally large mining um, or, or perhaps maybe if we leave those areas untouched for a while, could there be more gold deposits forming in future? Um, well, the, well, the answer is yes, but in a geological time frame, not in our lifetimes. I mean, you know, it, it takes millions of years or tens of thousands or hundreds of years for some of these deposits to form. I mean, if we're talking about the deposition of several thousand meters of the sediment, I mean, how long does it take to deposit that? Well, we know the deposit is 3 billion to 2.7 billion years old. So, you know, you need a few billion years. Geological processes are, to use a pun, glacially slow. They take forever, but they do occur. Um, so I think the answer would be not in our lifetimes, but, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a quote. I think it's... Um, I think it's a biblical quote. It's something along the lines of men come and go, but earth abides. Meaning, you know, we here on this planet for this little short while, but in a few billion years time, we won't be here, but sure as anything that <laughs> the geological processes will still be going on and whether it's gold or diamonds or whatever, you know, mm. um, but maybe to answer her question, there isn't gold actually f forming well, I should be careful how I say that. Um, there might be hydrothermal processes going on in deep down in the in in the crust of the Earth now, but it takes a very very long time. It's not an instantaneous thing. Unless a meteorite, a solid gold meteorite, hits the Earth and boom, you have an instant gold deposit. But that's unlikely. Yeah, sure. Um, all right, let me um, just take a few. Uh, thank you, everybody, once more for just uh, sticking out with us. Uh, we are really having a, a fantastic uh, morning with you, Prof. Uh, I feel like I just, you know, needed a cup of coffee just to sit and just have this engagement. Uh, let me just take uh, perhaps maybe three or four more last questions, and then let's wrap it up, um, you know, to, to release everybody to, uh, to go on about the, the beautiful day that's happening. Um, let me take Charles and Mike's question quickly about the uh, Frio de Front Dome. And... Um, yeah. Uh, Charles is asking, what is the influence of the Friere Frank Dome um, meteor incident uh, on the Vets Gold Reef deposits? And then just to follow up on that is, um, uh, did the impact of the Friere Frank Dome uh, crash, uh, Friere Frank crash, <laughs> influence the amount of gold deposits uh, that exist perhaps in the Vets region? Oh, a can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, okay, to begin with, it's, it's just, it's the Friede Fort, you know, as in Fort. And interestingly enough, that Paris area is, is, is a World Heritage Site, you know, where it actually, where this impact hit. Um, the, the impact of the Friede Fort obviously had to have been 
tremendous and 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 it hit um obviously later than the vitvara strain rocks formed because obviously it deformed them um and it was a massive meteorite impact and there's a lot published on it as well um and you can just imagine this meteor coming in and either exploding in the atmosphere above the earth or actually hitting the earth such that the impact had an effect all the way down in, into the into the mantle and the heat and the fluids involved that you know that was generated i mean rocks got vaporized you can go to that fear de fort area the to the uh, to the Parais area and you can see these things called pseudo tachylite where rocks were melted melted they granites that were there just got vaporized and melted so those fluids some people look this is like the vidvada strand they are they are people for and people against what what happened um did was the was the meteorite impact the the trigger for these fluids that then migrated were forced through the rocks of the vidvada strand leaching out the gold that was already there from the placer deposits and recrystallizing it was the was the was the gold dissolved in these hydrothermal fluids that then that would fit the hydrothermal model um uh, but certainly if 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 you go again and it's a very interesting area, area to go to if if you go there you can see that where the original horizontal rocks were and we had the impact they are totally overfolded they actually exploded and they bent over like this so you've got older rocks here overlying younger and and they were actually protecting and covering the rocks below from erosion so that impact actually served a purpose of although it was destructive it served a purpose in preserving um, the actual strata below look there's there's another school of thought if we talk about the bushveld complex you know that huge igneous complex yeah, to the north, which is younger than the Vitz, that intruded. Now there's some people who think that that generated heat and fluid that percolated down into the Vidvada strand that then caused the remobilization of gold. But you know, how do you move heat downwards? You know, geologists are fantastic. You know, it's on the one hand it's this, on the other hand it's that. It depends the data that you're working with. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Yeah. Definitely, definitely complex one. If we Problem, do run out, of, if, yeah. if we do run out of time and there are more questions, I'll be happy to answer them on email. Just by the way. Ah, awesome. In fact, you know what? Let me just take this last one. I think it's the best uh, question to end off with because of it relates to uh, to perhaps maybe a paper that you've uh, you've written um, mm -hmm. or participated in, uh, and it's coming from Carolize. And um, Carolize is asking, what is the perfect storm condition? Um, uh, in inverted commas, they're uh, only available during the Echiena era, if I'm mentioning that correctly, as mentioned in one of the academic papers that um, uh, Bruce showed. Oh, oh um, I would, if you really want the details of that, and there is a link to that paper, I think I have uh, the, the, um, the perfect storm, was a combination of all sorts of criteria. Um, you know, if we go back in time to the Archean, three billion years, um, was there oxygen in the atmosphere? Um, but oxygen, as we know today, you know, the amount of oxygen, maybe there were little pockets. Of, if, if, if you have oxygen widespread, you would oxidize things. And you know, pyrite is a sulfide. So therefore you would oxidize the pyrite and you wouldn't believe it. So if uh, you wouldn't preserve it. But if, so the perfect storm of all these criteria is having um, an anoxic environment. In other words, a reducing environment with little or no oxygen that you don't oxidize all of these sulfides. Um, the perfect storm of having this influx of all of this clastic sediment coming into this depression. Remember we have this basin in this ancient crust. So you have a perfect storm of a hollow, of a cavity, a basin in the crust. To receive this to receive the sediment that's eroding in from the surrounding area bringing in gold from where did all the, this is the first question we had bringing in this gold the perfect storm where did that gold come from how did we get it you know and 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 then later 
remobilization, perhaps a later storm. You know, it's a combination of a number of criteria that really there are there are literally thousands of publications in books, in journals, in the media, in theses, in company mind reports that discuss this really ad nausea to you know to say it 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 it's it's an it's a it's a fascinating topic. And actually I'm really in the periphery. My interest is in the minerals and the gold specimens and the geoheritage and the photography. I kind of assimilate uh, by via osmosis what I know about the vits if I can. I'm not I'm not the world's expert on the Vidvardisla and Goldfield by any means. I like it. <laughs> Prof, um, I think you've just um, hit the nail on the head and um, you've just taken us on, on a journey that, um, you know, <sighs> It's, yeah, I think you, it's just so fascinating. And I think beyond everything else, you're just such a great speaker. I think all of us could just sit here and just listen to you, you know, for almost um, uh, the whole day, even uh, just listening to, to some of the passion, how passionate you speak about it. I think um, you've demonstrated just the complexities, you know, once you see those rocks and gold embedded in them, you know, just the, how you'd want to infuse and to separate just the, the gold uh, deposits in from those rocks. And I yeah, definitely, um, you know, demonstrated the, the scientific difficulties and technicalities required to, to extract this, this, this mineral that we love. Um, but beyond that, just your passion just blows us away. Uh, every time you come on this platform, uh, there's just so many questions that come up. So thank you. Uh, thank you to you for, for, for just your passion and sharing your love um, for your work with all of us. No, thanks very much. And again, for inviting me and my apologies. I went on more than an hour, but it's a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a long topic. No, 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 no apologies. We love having guests and we love having you. So uh, to everybody that's still on the line, uh, just remember that we've got a 15% discount on mineral and gemstones of Southern Africa, uh, minerals uh, and gemstones of East Africa, uh, field guides uh, to rock and minerals of Southern Africa, uh, and pocket guide uh, rockets and minerals of southern africa all of them are available at the kistenbosch bookshop uh, so please head on over uh, come and visit the garden i think the garden is looking the garden is looking fantastic uh, heading up into spring there's beautiful stuff blooming so i think you'll have a really great time so um prof i think um uh, this is me wrapping it up uh, yes, 15 in 10 seconds uh, what do you have to say to everybody I'd say thanks to everyone for attending, especially during the week like this. I know people are very busy and I always appreciate it. I enjoy giving these talks. I hope uh, you enjoy hearing them. Thanks very much. Ah, awesome. Prof, we can almost guarantee that we will definitely have you again on this platform uh, because of you are just a breath of fresh air. And every time you speak about minerals, we all get jittery and happy on the inside. And um, once again, we want to just thank the, uh, send a shout out to all the beautiful ladies, uh, the two gems uh, of the world. Um, and happy Women's Month to, every, to all the ladies. Um, we really appreciate all of you. And um, from my side, it's been an absolute pleasure just being on this platform and just uh, welcoming Prof on the side. We will be meeting again in the next two weeks when we introduce another fantastic speaker and another great topic, which we'll share with everybody uh, a little bit later on. But from my side, I don't want to take any more time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's been an absolute blast. Have a fantastic week. And until we meet again in the next two weeks. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Cheers, Prof. Thanks, John. Bye. All the best. All right. Oh. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.